Hello everyone, this is the second lecture for the mechanical portion of ME2653. Today we're going to talk about chip type machining. So, uh, why machine parts? So, uh, there's some parts we can we can cast and it's the best way to, to make a part or the most economical way and that's usually in, in manufacturing what it gets down to is what's going to be the, the cheapest way to make something that satisfies the design intent and objectives. So, uh, some parts we just can't we can't cast. We need a better surface finish in an area. Uh, you know, maybe we need to mate parts together, and we need really nice, flat, uh, accurate surfaces. Maybe we need sharp corners that we can't cast. Maybe we need to put some kind of a groove in. Uh, maybe we need some kind of very complex profile, or we just can't get with casting. Um, there's lots of reasons why we might need to machine parts. Um, you know, it's a lot of times it'll be a combination. Maybe you'll cast something and then post machine it, something like a cylinder head or an engine block, uh, where, you know, when those are mass produced, they're going to be cast in large quantities, and then the castings will all be machined, and their surfaces will be, like the deck surface where the cylinder head mates will be will be machined off, will be milled off, holes will be drilled out. So uh, some parts will be fully machined from scratch, from a billet of material. Uh, there's lots of different reasons why we want to machine parts, and that's going to continue for the foreseeable future. Uh, 3D printing and metal 3D printing is starting to become a, a bigger thing uh, and even those parts usually require quite a bit of post machining so uh, machining is going to be around for a while so it's it's one of the more important methods of manufacturing in mechanical engineering so it's important that we we cover it in quite a bit of depth so uh, types of parts to be machined there's lots of things things like shafts uh, you know, like an automobile or like in, uh, in transmissions, car transmissions, things like that. Uh, you need very, very strong shafts that also have features like splines on them. And splines are very hard to cast in place. Uh, you know, you might need the thing to be forged to be strong enough. So you've got to forge the thing, but you're probably not going to be able to forge most splines in. Um, so they're there's still going to have to be post-machined. Um, Tube fittings, molds for molds especially. Mold making is machining is, is huge in mold making. So uh, molds for injection molded parts, uh, stamping molds for stamping sheet metal for like how cars are made. Uh, mold making is still done primarily with with machining. Uh, some fasteners, you know, usually fasteners depends on what kind of fasteners. Most fasteners are probably going to be some kind of a forging process, uh, just for the strength and also the speed. You know, things like threads, you'll probably roll the threads in, you're probably not going to machine threads unless you're making custom fasteners, but you know, maybe some custom fasteners you might, you might need to machine them. Uh, engine parts, again, you know, engine blocks, engine heads, those are usually cast and then post machined for tolerance. Uh, tools and dies for stamping, I already mentioned that. Uh, some bearing parts, gears, sprockets, there's all sorts of parts that you might want to machine. So, uh, there's really, yeah, basically any part that you want to make out of metal, you can probably machine it. Uh, so, what materials can be machined? So, it's really anything we can make a chip out of, we can machine. So, we can make chips in metal, we can make chips in wood, we can make chips in plastics. You know, ceramics, we're starting to get to the point where it gets a little, little iffy. They're just so brittle that it's, it's hard to make chips. Uh, composites, you know, carbon fiber reinforced plastic, you can machine that. Uh, you have to take special precautions and use special tooling, but it, it does machine somewhat well. Uh, stones things like that uh you know by milling um, for granite you can actually mill it's more like grinding but you can grind granite um concrete too you can you get into these brittle materials it starts to be you're more honestly in the grinding range than in the machining range but uh because you're not really making chip chips but you're same basic process where it's a subtractive process where you're removing material with a with a cutter a turning is when you have a part that is rotating and then you feed a stationary tool in uh, and the tool is going to cause material to be removed in the form of chips. Drilling is when you have a stationary part, a rotating cutter that you plunge in and remove material and chips. Milling, you have a rotating cutter, feed the material in and again you remove material in chips. Grinding, you use an abrasive cutter and so you remove little bitty tiny particles of material uh, not really chips but the same basic process it's just the form of the material that's removed is different here you get little curly Q chips here you get chunks sawing uh, 
fixed or moving part saw blade uh, and then you have chips removed and a little bitty curly cues uh, planing we have a work piece moving and then the tool is moving laterally and we remove material and chips shaping we have work piece moving back and forth sorry actually the tool is reciprocating and the work piece will be moving into the page uh, broaching we have a fixed part and then we have a tool that's got multiple different uh, expanding cutting geometry that we move through the tool move through the uh, the, the piece to cut it um, so different different methods are suited for for different and we use different methods for different geometry that we're trying to produce anything that's a revolved profile we're probably going to turn uh, you know if we need to make holes we're going to drill them uh, if we're going to if we just need to base the surface off we're going to mill it if we need to remove material very precisely from a hard material we can grind it uh, if we need to cut something in half we can or cut something into pieces we can saw it uh, if we need to shape a surface, we can plane it. If we need to uh, cut like a, a spline or something like that, we can use a shaper. Uh, if we need to make a square cornered hole or, uh, you know, like if we need to make a hole that's got sharp corners, broaching is about the only one of these methods that works for that. Um, or if we need to do something like rifling in a barrel, something like that, we, we can use broaching for it. Uh, okay. Each each process has its has its uses and has its strengths and weaknesses, and we'll, we'll talk about most of these through the course of the class. Uh, so variables in the process, uh, things you can control. You can control what kind of tooling you have. You can, to some extent, control what material you're manufacturing or you're, you're machining, uh, the condition it's in, the temperature of the process, uh, the machining parameters like cutting speed and feed. Uh, whether or not you're using some kind of lubricant like cutting fluid or cutting oil, um, the tool you're using itself, the machine tool, uh, the piece of equipment, and how you've had the part fixtured. And all of these things will go into determining um, the dependent variables, what kind of chip you're producing, uh, the force and the energy that's dissipated, uh, the temperature rise and all these things. Everything's going to get hot machining. It's a, there's a lot of friction, so it's going to get warm. Uh, that's the limiting factor in a, in a lot of a lot of operations is the heat generation. Uh, wear of your tool and or failure of tool breaking tools. That's something that happens for, quite commonly in manufacturing is breaking tools. Um, and then the surface finish you produce. So speed and feed. Those are the two things you have the most control over. You know, once you've picked your tooling, once you you know what you need to machine, uh, you really need to get these two things right. And if you get these two things right, you at least have a chance of making something that that's going to work. Uh, so this is speed. So in turning, it's the I'm turning some part, and that is the velocity at where the cutter is going to be rammed into this thing. It's the slip velocity between the part and the cutter. Uh, in milling, so I've got a tool that's turning, so and it's the same basic thing. If this was fixed and this is the turning mill, then it's the velocity at the interface between the mill and the fixed part. So it's essentially the relative velocity of the tool versus the part. We measure that in surface feet per minute. Uh, SFM is what you usually see that, SFPM too, but uh, SFM is what that's usually reported as in the surface feet per minute. Uh, that's where most of the power in the operation is going to go. It goes to the force and the cutting direction. Uh, so in this case, this part's ro tool's rotating that way. There's going to be a force that acts on the cutter, and there's going to be a force that acts on the part that'll be equal and opposite. Uh, that force times that velocity is going to give you, you know, after you correct for units, it's going to give you the power that's the, that, uh, the, the cutting power. That's going to be most of the power requirements in a machining process. Uh, feed rate. So that's how fast you're moving the tool versus the, the stationary part in a mill. Uh, and turning, so looking down on it, so if I'm turning some kind of a cylinder with a tool, so I've got, let me step this down. So if I've got some kind of a tool that I'm running in to cut this thing, this workpiece is rotating about its axis and I'm moving the tool that way, uh, that would be the feed rate. Uh, you can do it continuously, you can do it in steps, depending on what, what you're machining. Uh, it's a fairly small amount of the power, and it's the, the force required to push this thing this way and the velocity you feed. The force might be high, but the velocity you're feeding is relatively low compared to the, the, the speed V, the surface feet per minute. So the power drops. Is, 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 most of the power is in the, 
the cutting speed times the cutting force. It's not in the feed speed times the feed force. So uh, this is usually going to be in inches per something, inches per stroke, per revolution, per tooth. Uh, there's lots of different ways of reporting that. Inches per revolution is pretty common, too. Millimeters per revolution in metric. Uh, depth of cut. Uh, so getting back to my drawings here, bad drawings, so I'd like to say. Uh, depth of cut would be how deep we're putting the tool in. Uh, same for, for milling, too. It's, it's how, how much we step this mill over whenever we take the next, next path. So uh, that's going to be perpendicular to the distance of tool travel. Uh, usually keep that constant when you're machining. Uh, it's going to be in whatever your inches, units of length are, inches or, or millimeters. Material removal rate is going to be how much material you're removing in volume divided by the cutting time. Uh, there's a table in the book, 21.2, that will give you a good outline of uh, different processes and their applications. So uh, it's really good to look at these tables in the, in the book if you want to know, know more about this, especially for, for homework and ex or, uh, quiz and exam problems. Uh, chip formation. So in machining of metals, relatively ductile things, you're going to form chips when you machine. Uh, and the quality of chip is going to be very, very good chips mean you're doing a good job in, in manufacturing usually or in machining. So if you're making good chips, you're going to get a good surface finish. You're not going to tear your tooling up. Uh, you're going to get good dimensional accuracy. So a lot of you know, learning to be a good machinist is learning how to make good chips. Uh, so essentially what you're doing here, you're moving your workpiece or you're moving your, your what you're going to machine in your cutting tool is going to be here and again the cutting tool might be moving the workpiece might be stationary or vice versa but either way that's going to be a relative velocity between those two uh, you've got a sharp edge here you've got a hard cutting tool that's harder than whatever it is you're trying to machine uh, and then at some point something's going to give uh, and hopefully it is the material you're trying to remove that gives and you're going to shear off a piece of the material so there's going to be a shear plane here there's going to be a chip that starts to form the chips going to curl up on the edge of the tool uh, and you know if you do it right you're going to get nice big curly Q chips and a good surface finish uh, a lot of that depends on material and speed and feed too we'll talk about in a second uh, so I highly recommend you watch the video of chip formation uh, unfortunately I can't show it in these slides on YouTube because of copyright reasons but uh, I will post these slides and you guys can can see this video um, so uh, here's if you can't um, I mean, if you're not if you're just watching this on YouTube and don't have access to the slides uh, I'll show a, a snippet of this I can't show the full thing uh, but you guys can look up this this video if you're interested in it on on YouTube uh, so I highly recommend watching this. It really shows, it's really interesting, shows chip, shows the shear plane formation, so for different operations. So I'll show a few snippets of it. Uh, again, highly recommend you watch, watch this chip formation video. Uh, so when machining, and what you'll see in that video is there's three basic types of chips. There's discontinuous, where the chips essentially are separated from each other and fall off in chunks. Uh, there's continuous chips, which are the big, long, curly cues, and then there's continuous chips that leave a built-up edge on, on the tool. Uh, ideally, we want the curly cues. Uh, the curly cues are leave the best surface finish. They leave the best dimensional accuracy. They get heat out. Uh, they're, they're nicer on the tool. I mean, ideally, that's what we want. There's some materials it just doesn't work on. So uh, where you get discontinuous chips is when you have a brittle material. You know, if you can think about it right, if you're machining off a brittle material, this is a harder material. There's going to be cracks in it. It's going to crack and break. You know, a softer, more ductile material like aluminum, it's going to be more likely to leave a nice, happy, curly Q chip. It's one of the reasons why aluminum is so nice to machine is it makes good curly Q chips. Uh, cast iron is not nice to machine because it's got all sorts of gack in it, big chunks of carbon in it, and uh, it, it causes brittle spots and it, it breaks into little powdery chips and it just doesn't machine very nicely at all in most cases. Uh, so you're going to work hard, and materials that work hard and will also do discontinuous chips. Uh, there's some stainless steels that work hard and really bad that are just a nightmare to machine. There's some stainless steels that aren't bad to machine, but there's some that they work hard and really bad and so when you start to machine you you make the stuff you're trying to machine harder and you make the chips hard and so the chips just fall apart and 
it, it, it just ends up being a nightmare. There's some materials like, you know, really bad, like low 40, 50, 60 KSI yield strength stainless steels that you'd think would be easy to machine because their yield strength's relatively low that are not easy to machine because they work hard and so bad. Um, so again, brittle work material, you know, brittle materials are usually a pain to machine. You know, the more ductile something is up to a point. At some point, things can get so ductile they get gummy and that can cause a whole set of problems. But uh, again, there's some general ductile metals machine pretty well. In the, the harder, more brittle materials, it starts to be more of a problem. You start getting more into the grinding range. Uh, small rake angles on cutting tools. So getting back to well, this slide, this would be the rake angle here. The more shallow that rake angle is, the more likely you are to get discontinuous tools. Uh, course machine feeds so if you're trying to remove lots of material and you're, you're pushing the feed rate really high you might get discontinuous chips you might do that for just getting rid of lots of material and you don't care about the surface finish uh, you'll come back later and do a finishing pass on one reason you you push the feed rate up uh, low cutting speeds you know sometimes it's counterintuitive sometimes you actually need to increase your machine speed to get nice continuous chips uh, there's really usually a sweet spot in, in machining that if you're in that sweet spot, it, it works great. If you're too fast, you're too slow. If you're too fast, you make too much too much force, too much heat, and that causes problems. If you're too slow, you get bad chip formation and it doesn't work. So um, it's usually a nice nice spot where there's a good combination of, of speed and feed where you get good chips for most materials. Uh, you get bad surface finish. With bad chip uh, formation, you have a bad surface finish. So an example on this... Uh, I've done a lot of turning of uh, aluminum alloys like 6061, 7050, things like that. They make good chips. You get good surface finish on them. It's easy to get, especially turning. You can get almost a mirror polished surface finish on, on aluminum. It just machines beautifully. Uh, you know, stuff like 4130, 4340 steel, you know, higher strength alloy steel. You really got to be right in the sweet spot on making chips on that to get the good curly Q chips. If you're, you're just, you know, for most combinations of speeds and feeds, you get a lot of discontinuous chips and you get a really bad surface finish. You can get good accuracy, but the surface looks looks crappy. So, uh, yeah, there's some materials that are a lot more forgiving than than others, and usually the the harder, more brittle material is, the the more you're gonna have trouble with this, and the more you're gonna have surface finish issues, and the more likely you are need to to grind something to get a really good finish. Again, continuous chips, that's really what we want. Um, so uh, these look like a continuous curly cue of metal. Uh, again, this usually means you're doing things right. Uh, this is mainly ductile, ductile materials. It's easier. The right feed rate, uh, which is less feed usually, up to a point. You can go, you can feed so little that you really don't get chips at all. Uh, but you know, even for uh, again, for some some materials, it's really hard to not get good curly Q chips, and for some materials, it's almost impossible. So a lot of it depends on what material you're cutting. Uh, sharp cutting tools, you know, the sharper the tool, the more likely it is you're going to get your nice curly Qs. Uh, larger rake angles, so raking your tool back. Uh, proper cutting speeds, which where do you get proper cutting speeds? We'll do a little bit of the math later on uh, for milling and, and turning in, in later lectures. Uh, but you look these up in tables for the most part. Uh, if you're an experienced machinist who's been making stuff for years, you can kind of use the force and figure something out that, that makes good chips. But for everyone else, it's, it's good to just look it up in a table. And then at least, you know, for the tool you've got, for the material you're trying to cut, um, look it up in the table and that'll get you close on that. Coolants are going to help. Lubrication is going to help. Uh, so that's something that, that it, you know, there's some materials that dry cutting is fine. I think certain kinds of brass cut dry perfectly well. Some aluminums, it's fine. You know, harder, stronger materials, you probably want to have some kind of coolant. Uh, also, coolant and lubrication, right? It does, does two things. So um, problems. So, and this is why that lubrication thing works, is frictional heating. Uh, so you've got continuous chip, the chip's in continuous contact with the tooling, there's continuous rubbing friction there, and it's going to gonna increase the heat. So uh, hopefully if you do this right, the heat mostly goes out in the chip. Uh, greater chance of work or injury, this one you should not underestimate. Uh, so these chips are, uh, for harder materials like steels, these chips can be really, really hard and really, really sharp. I mean, they can almost be razor blade sharp and out of, a, I mean, if, especially for really hard work hardening materials that you're pushing really far, you can get something that is work hardened or even heat treated because it gets real hot and then it quenches in the air. And so you can get really, really hard, really, really sharp 
chips uh, and it, they actually can be very dangerous I've cut myself on these chips numerous times um, it's just something that you got to be be careful with and you got a big pile of these things you got to dispose of and you need to make sure you wear gloves when you when you dispose of them uh, these things can collect around the tool especially in a, in a drilling operations you'll get a big wad of chips that'll usually wrap around the tool it'll be slung around in a circle uh, in turning, you can get a giant wad of chips that'll be turning around with the part, and uh, sometimes it, 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 clearing it can be an issue. Uh, and sometimes you can get just really strong, hard, curly cues of chips that you've got to actually get get like, get snips out to cut them into pieces to remove them. So uh, sometimes you know doing getting good chips comes with a disadvantage if you actually have to do something with your big curly cue of chips at some point. Uh, built up edge. So built up edge is a residue of the material that you're cutting that builds up on the cutting tool. Uh, so this is usually softer materials. So you get into this on an aluminum, you'll get built up edges on, on aluminum. But you might be getting a good chip, but then some particles of this material are going to weld themselves to the surface and screw up your surface finish. And some parts are going to weld to the cutting tool. And uh, it's going to end up making your nice sharp cutting tool a big blunt chunk of soft material, and your cutting your cut quality goes to crap. Uh, your tool life goes to crap because the heat generation goes up. Your it, basically everything gets worse. So uh, you'll see this a lot in in aluminum, uh, especially cutting dry cutting without any kind of coolant. You'll see uh, a built up edge form. And uh, basically, if you're machining and your cut quality goes down really fast, but your tool doesn't seem to have broken or anything bad happening, and you're, you don't see really hot chips, you probably got a built up edge. Uh, so stop, check, you'll usually see a little little burr of whatever material you're cutting on your cutting tool. You can use uh, something like a, a pick or something to get it off, and then you're back to machining being good. This will change your tolerances on whatever it is you're cutting, because you're changing your cutter geometry. Uh, so it's something worth checking every once in a while, and then this is one of the main reasons to use, to use coolant. Uh, you can see in that video... Uh, it's about 33 seconds you'll see a built up edge in that that's it's, it's worth and I highly recommend watching that that chip formation video you, know, you can see here the built up edge stuck on the nice nice cutter we've got this big chunk of the material we're cutting that's acting like the cutting surface and you, you can imagine right instead of the nice hardened steel or carbide cutting tool I've got a chunk of aluminum that I'm using to cut aluminum it's not going to work very well uh, so, non-ferrous metals, again, like aluminum, low carbon steel, softer steels, uh, and this usually is going to happen and get worse when the tool begins to dull. This will happen on nice sharp tooling too, so uh, for really soft gummy materials, uh, but usually as the tool gets dull, it's going to get worse. Uh, reduce your depth of cut, uh, change the rake change your cutting speed, coolant. This is usually the biggest thing you really, really need to do for materials like this, uh, is coolant helps a lot. Uh, maybe different cutting tool material, but again, usually the best solution, in my experience, when you're having problems with this, is use coolant. It's not a problem. With CNC equipment is usually not an issue because you've got flood coolant and you can just blast the thing from all angles with, with jets of coolant. Uh, on manual machines, it's really nice to have a coolant feed system of some kind and some kind of a reservoir so you're not getting it all over your shop uh, you know dripping cutting oil in every once in a while is if you have to is fine but it's really nice having some kind of a pump based coolant system on any machine manual or CNC they make chip breakers too uh, especially in CNC equipment where you don't want big giant wads of chips to, to get bound up in whatever it is you're machining or on your drill bits or things like that they make chip breaking tools that'll have a groove in them so the chip will go through this groove and it'll deform enough that it'll it'll break into little chunks uh, or there'll be a, some kind of a hard stop uh, they make mills that have uh, the flutes have discontinuities in them uh, that'll cause uh, chips to break they'll have like a roughing in mills that look like a corn cob almost uh, and they just basically remove little bitty chunks and uh, the, the cut quality the surface finish is going to be worse than a nice sharp continuous cutting edge uh, but you can really remove material fast you know, and and so for you know roughing geometry down those corn cobs do they do a great job that's why they're roughers that's what they're for uh, and then you can use the finishing end mill for a nice surface finish at the end uh, orthogonal machining uh, so this is when the cutting tool is straight and perpendicular to the motion so in this case if the motion is going to be this way the cutting tool will be straight into the page here uh, so things like uh, uh, grooving operations or especially parting in a lathe this is an orthogonal process and your forces are going to be 
there's going to be a normal force and then there's going to be the the force uh, from the actual cutting and there's not going to be forces out of plane with orthogonal machining uh, downside of this is your chips all form in a big curly cue here uh, and that can, you have to clear that at some point in time. Uh, it's, it's pretty rare or just purely orthogonal machining. Uh, again, the main things you have to worry about here, I don't know, this, this diagram is a little over complicated. Uh, you've got your cutting force, which is the force from the tool being moved into the part. And then you've got your n n tangential force or your normal, it's not, okay, it's not really tangential, it's really, this is the way you're cutting. There's a force this way that is the material pushing up on the tool and your total force is going to be the vector sum of those two components um, the cutting force and the the normal force from from the material pushing on the tool so uh, those can be measured with load cells and in higher end machines they might be measured or inferred from uh, from the load on the servos um, and there's been a lot of research in that area on, on you know, calculating those forces. Uh, but again, the main thing is on orthogonal machining, uh, you get these curly Q chips and that you're, you, you don't have, again, this, this is perpendicular to the direction you're moving, so the chips basically form into big curls that have to be, be cleared. Um, you usually have some kind, of, uh, some kind of angle of inclination in your oblique machining in most cases, uh, where in this case, your direction of travel is your material is moving that way, and instead of being perpendicular to that, there's some uh, angle to the, there's some inclination to the tool, uh, and you machine chips in heli helical chips rather than a little curly Q spiral. Uh, chip clearing is better. Your forces are better. You do have an out of plane force. You're going to have a component of force in that direction, uh, but uh, it's usually going to work work better in most most cases. So. In oblique machining, you've got three components. Your primary cutting force, that's going to be in the direction of the cutting vector, so the direction of the velocity, the relative velocity of the part to the chip, tool to the, the relative velocity of the tool to the workpiece. Uh, this is where most of your power is going to go. Uh, it's the largest force, but it also has the largest relative velocity. Power is force times velocity, so the, the velocity is the key here on why most of your power is going to go into the actual cutting force. Uh, the feed force, oops, I just threw my pin. All right, got my pin. So the feed force is, so that would be the force on the cutting tools, the way this is modeled. Uh, so this would be the cutting force, the force from the part onto the cutting tool. The feed force would be the force from pushing, the, the reaction force to pushing the tool to advance it into the material. Uh, that's going to be only about half of the cutting force. Uh, but it's significantly less power because this velocity is a lot higher than the feed velocity. So that's why even though it's only about half the, the force, it's a lot more velocity in the cutting direction. So there's a lot more power in that direction. So very little power goes into actually advance. Oops, it goes to advancing the tool. Radial force is the force that the material. So you're, you're shearing this off. Let me get to the back to the picture here. Uh, here. So you're, what's a better picture? Here we go. So you're you're shearing this chip off. You're going to compress and squish this material here, uh, and it's going to act like a spring that's going to try to push the tool away from the material. Uh, so there's going to be a force in that direction that's going to be on the order of half or so of the cutting force. Here we go. This radial force is going to act away from the machining, uh, away basically uh, radial to the direction of the part in turning. Uh, small power requirement because there's almost no velocity in that direction. Uh, the force can be, again, on the order of about 50% of the cutting force, so it can be a pretty high force, but there's no velocity, so there's no, no power in that direction. So this radial force uh, depends on what material you're machining, you know, how, how springy it is, essentially, and how aggressive you're cutting. Uh, this one's going to have a big impact on your dimensional accuracy of your part, essentially how springy the material is. Uh, it's because it's it's gonna how much material rebounds after you cut it's gonna depend on how how aggressive you're cutting what material you're cutting uh, and and this is gonna have a big impact on your final turned radius especially on on turned parts uh, this how the material spring backs as you machine it so we'll talk more about that when we get into turning but that has a big impact on your your quality of your cut for your your surface your not surface finish your uh, dimensional accuracy after your your turning operation. 
So if you plot these uh, cutting forces over different variables here, this is cutting speed. At some point in time, this is going to taper off and you cut faster. These forces don't go up. The power goes up because your, your, all these velocities go up, especially your cutting force, your, your, your cutting speed V goes up. Uh, so you're, you're, you're generating more power because the, even if the force is constant, your velocity is higher, so the power goes up. So you might run into heat generation problems, but the forces are going to taper off at, at cutting speed. Uh, as you increase depth of cut, radial force stays roughly constant. Uh, cutting force goes up, feed force goes up. Uh, feed and inches per revolution on turning, as you increase that, they all, they all go up. This isn't linear, it's kind of a log graph here. Uh, so the main thing on this is as you get faster, you, as your V increases, the cutting forces are gonna, they're gonna hit some, some point where they, they say roughly constant, but the, the heat generation is gonna go up because your V is higher for the same, same amount of cutting force, so the power F times V goes up. Uh, depth of cut, these things are gonna, these forces are gonna go up quite a bit, the cutting and feed forces. Uh, radial is gonna stay about, about the same. Uh, and then inches per revolution, as that goes up, all the forces go up. Power, again, power is force times velocity. With these units, you're going to get foot pounds per minute. Uh, we need to convert that to horsepower to get pounds here in our crazy set of units. So we take force times velocity divided by 33,000. Uh, that's going to give us horsepower. So why is it 33,000? A horsepower is 550 foot-pounds per second. We've got foot-pounds per minute, so it's going to be 550 times 60. Um, specific horsepower, horsepower divided by material removal rate. Uh, there's going to be a table of this for materials, so uh, for certain materials you don't have to look up what the specific horsepower is going to be. For a material and from that and your material removal rate you can estimate how much horsepower you need for your spindle or you can turn that around and say you know how much horsepower i have in my spindle what the specific horsepower is for a material what's the maximum material removal rate i can do before i start to max out my machine uh, this isn't going to be more important for mass production uh, when you're really trying to make parts quickly you're going to run into horsepower limits on on a spindle and if you're just making one-off parts you can always slow down a little bit if you don't have enough machine. Uh, if you're trying to really crank stuff out though, you want to you know, max out, you want to be close to the maximum power uh, to make parts as, as fast as possible. Uh, skin. You can use this for estimating how much power you need or if you have a, your machine, you can estimate how much material removal you can get. Uh, you can estimate cutting forces and determine how what your maximum depth of cut is for a specific amount of power you've got. Uh, so, uh, in general, 30 to 40 percent of the energy goes into friction. 30 to 60 to 70, the remainder of that is going to go into the the, the work done by shearing the material. Uh, so, this material, this amount that goes into friction, that is, it's going to make stuff hot. So that's going to be one of the limiting factors in machining is is the heat generation and what it does to your tool. Uh, what it does to the material you're, you're machining. So uh, you can look up the table in the book. 21.3 gives you the specific energy and unit powers for common materials. So again, if you wanted to estimate this, so you need to look up that up in a ta table. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can probably find this online too by, by Googling it. Uh, so here's a table of formulas from the book. This is really handy. Uh, again, if you want to do any kind of machining, small scale, or especially if you want to do it in a large scale in a you know big machine shop with CNC equipment, you really need to calculate your speeds and feeds. If you've got a lot of experience, you can sort of sit there and use the force and figure out how fast you should turn something and how fast you should feed a tool in. But if you really want to do it right, you need to look it up and at least start using the calculations for you get the, use the calculations for a starting point for your speeds and feeds. So. Um, this gives you the cutting speed, uh, so take RPM and turning it into your surface speed for turning. Uh, this takes uh, revolutions per minute from your speed and your so D diameter workpiece here. Uh, this is your feed rate in inches per minute from your feed rate in inches per revolution times RPM. 
Uh, units are all over the place in this, so that's why you need to pay attention down here. This gives you your, your units down here. And I know for those of you that are living in metric land, this is incredibly frustrating. It's, it is incredibly frustrating for us as well. So uh, cutting time, length of cut divided by surface speed and inches per minute, feed rate and inches per minute. Material removal rate, this is how you calculate it. Uh, depth of cut, feed rate, cutting velocity then a unit correction in there. Horsepower calculation, um, material removal rate times the specific horsepower, which you'll have to look up in a table. Uh, horsepower required at motor, you need your machine efficiency in there. Which is probably pretty high in most cases, but uh, you can calculate torque too. I don't want to scratch that out, but you can calculate torque too if you've got your horsepower and your RPM. Uh, for milling, you've got a separate table here. For drilling, you've got a separate table here. You'll need these calculations for the uh, quizzes and for the exams, too. So uh, I haven't talked about quizzes or exams. Those will be due. I'll put the quiz for this next, the week you get back from spring break, uh, just because we can't do any quizzes for points this week for the soft start. So uh, those will be next, next week after spring break. So your, your shearing material away, the shear stress is going to be quite high. I mean, you, you have to, because you can imagine the forces at the cutting point here are really, really high. And for harder materials, it's going to be higher. So in general, as materials get harder, uh, the shear stresses go up. So um, that shouldn't be any big, big surprise. And for some materials, the machine nice, they make good chips. Some materials are they're just too hard to make good chips, and this doesn't work very well. Or maybe you need an, an even harder tool. So... Uh, you know, certain things high-speed steel works great for, which is a, a hard, high-carbon steel. Uh, certain things you need carbide, which is a tungsten carbide, which is a ceramic material that, that's, that's going to be a lot harder than most of the metals you try to machine. We'll talk more about that when we get into uh, turning and milling. Uh, one of the main limiting factors as far as how much you can push is heat generation. Uh, so you've got the shear front, so the, the friction of the shear front. Uh, you've got friction of the chip on the tool, especially for those continuous chips. Uh, and then you've got the sliding friction here at the flank of the tool. These are all going to, there's, there's force, there's slip. If you have force and slip, you've got friction and you've got heat. So uh, you can see that for cutting speed, the, this distribution changes. So at low cutting speed, uh, there's a little bit going into the chip. There's a good chunk going into the tool. There's a good chunk going into the workpiece. Work as I go faster, as V goes up, you see that more of the heat is in the chip and less is in the tool and in the workspace. Now, you're making more heat. So this looks like this is going to be you know, universally better because more of the work heat's going into the chip. The chip's leaving. I'm getting heat out of the process. Things work great. But I'm also making more heat because I'm going faster. So at some point in time, you, and faster isn't always better. Uh, but usually, again, there's some sweet spot where you're getting a lot of your heat into the chip. You don't care about the chip. The chip you're going to recycle and send off to somebody else. You don't care about the properties of the chip as long as you're making a good chip and getting it out of the machine. Uh, it's great that you're removing heat in the chip. Again, at some point, you can push too fast and you still have too much heat going into your tool. Uh, and you soften the tool and then, then you have problems. Uh, heat distribution, Again, this stuff gets hot. You're creating a lot of friction. Your tooling's going to get hot. Your workpiece is going to get hot. You might get hot enough that you heat treat the material you're machining, which might be a really bad thing. Uh, you know, usually if you're heat treating, it's going to get harder and it's going to get harder to machine on the next step. You know, especially turning something. If you heat treat it on your first pass and make it harder than your next pass, it's going to be harder to machine and then it might not machine very well at all. So uh, coolant is the most universal solution to this. Uh, you can almost, in some materials, you can basically push twice as hard and have twice the material removal rate with, with coolant. Uh, and this is in C here. This can get quite hot, you know, hot enough that uh, it can cause pretty, pretty serious burns, hot enough to cause chips to glow, uh, hot enough even to cause chips to melt, which I, I've seen that in aluminum, pushing a little bit too hard without coolant you can get chips to actually melt in aluminum. And then usually after that you dull your work, This the, the tip of your tool gets hot and softens, and then when it softens, if it's a steel alloy, like high-speed steel, it softens, it gets dull, you make more heat, that's a positive feedback loop, and it ends up in things gumming up and your tool breaking. Uh, so that's usually a limiting factor, and uh, you know if your feed and speed and everything are correct, pushing harder and harder, usually at some point in time, if you don't just break your tool, uh, the limiting factor is going to be 
be heat. So we'll talk about this in more detail for turning and milling separately from each other. Uh, but, you know, most of this, it all gets back to this table here. Uh, you'll need these calculations, and we'll talk about some of uh, how, to, how to select the velocity, how to select the feed rates for these different operations for turning, milling, and drilling separately in separate lectures. So uh, that's it for today. Again, there won't be a quiz on that on this this week, but I will post a quiz on Canvas for this material on Monday when you get back from spring break. Uh, and this will also be on the next exam when that's coming up. So that's it for today. Thank you all, and I will have another lecture for you after you get back from spring break.